Pastor, if you could kindly pray and we can start. Okay, let me click this continue. Okay, okay, we welcome you all to this Milk and Milk to Meet Bible study this morning on June 2021 on the Father's Day. And we wish you, of course, me, myself and Mano, we wish each other a happy Father's Day. We were the first one to do this, but happy Father's Day to all the fathers and the would-be fathers. Okay, with the, that, let's have a word of prayer. A gracious God, our Heavenly Father, this morning, especially Lord, on this Father's Day, we are reminded of God that we have an eternal Father. And Lord, if you have not been our Father God, we do not know what would have happened to our lives and everything that you have given to us, oh God. We don't know, Lord, how we would have been, we been able to use them all for you and for your glory. But Lord, by being our Father, <clears throat> Lord, you give us meaning to our lives. And God, by being our Father, you channelized our life, our energy, our resources, potential, in the right direction of God. And you help us, God, to be successful minister of your gospel in various capacities, wherever we are, O oh God, and whatever we are doing, Father. But you helped us, O oh God, and directed us, O oh Father, and you brought out our potential to serve you, God, and use our life very meaningfully. And Lord, we know today we don't see our eternal Father with our physical eyes, but a day is coming when our Lord Jesus is going to come back and take us into the presence, the physical presence of our eternal Father. And what? And Lord, I can just imagine the joy that we will have on that day. I am sure we will be flabbergasted, O oh God, and we will have no words to say, Father, because there's going to be a glorious, glorious scenario, God, beyond our imagination of God. And we are just waiting to be in the presence of our eternal Father. But God, till then, you always guide us and provide all our needs and surround us with your care and surround us with your protection of God. And only and only because of you, Father, we survive day by day in our physical life and spiritual life and whatever department or compartment of life that we uh, we survive with God. And so we want to thank you, give glory to your holy name. And today, once again, as we come together, Lord, to study your words in this Milk to Meet Bible study, Father, once again, we pray that you would give us your understanding, open the eyes of our, uh, our minds, help us, God, to focus our being uh, on this study, oh God, help us, God, to see you and the work that you have done for us, oh God. And just through all this, we will grow in our faith and help others to grow in their faith of God and together glorify your holy name. And so we commit ourselves in your hands. Thank you once again for Brother Mano and thank you Lord for granting him that desire of God and that passionate heart of Father to study your word of God and bring the meat out and serve to all of us of God. And I pray that you continue to be with him and continue to grant him more and more of your grace and knowledge and wisdom and everything it takes, O oh God, to study your words and teach your words. And so I, that goes for all of us. And to that end, we commit ourselves in your mighty and power. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor, for that wonderful <laughs> prayer, along with Pastor Samson Parekh and me, Mano, and our family, Sangeeta and uh, Ruben Itai. We wish all of you a very happy Father's Day. I was originally thinking about... Uh, you know, thinking about speaking something or teaching today is something on the Father's Day aspect. But then I realized as we're doing the study, there's actually a lot that uh, that, are, that is relevant as Father, as the Father being eternal, the everlasting Father, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Wonderful, the Counselor, and the Everlasting Father is what it says is His name. And uh, so we can look to Him as Pastor prayed, the Eternal Father who guides us. And uh, oh, so distinct and set apart that today's study is relevant in that context that there is no one like him. In fact, that's why when we pray the Lord's Prayer uh, or the prayer of the disciples that the Lord taught us to pray, uh, we pray and we say, 
um, uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And hallowed be thy name is holy be thy name. And holy meaning being distinct. God, let your name be so distinct, unlike any other. And in order for God's name to be distinct, we ought to be distinct people of God. And so that is the tie-in in terms of the Father's Day today that we celebrate, that we celebrate the greatest Father of all, the most loving Father of all. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed unto us that we should be called the children of God, that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, so that we can become the children, the sons and daughter of God. And so, for, you know, so, so to be distinct such that people will see our lives and they will glorify the eternal, the everlasting Father, the hallowed Father, Father in heaven. So happy Father's Day. Welcome to Milk to Meat, uh, June 20, 2021, the year of the Lord. We've been studying the Mosaic Covenant. And last week, we learned about what it meant to have God's people to be, you know, to be eating certain types of foods and not eating certain types of food, abstaining from that which is abominable, that which defiles. And today, we we'll look at actually what it means to be, to be distinct as God's people from Leviticus chapter 12. Um, last week, we covered the dietary rules in in Leviticus chapter 11, and this week we'll look at the, the distinct rules from Leviticus chapter um, 12 as it pertains to circumcision and the offerings to atone for then cleanse from the issue of blood and to make whole. So that's kind of what our study is going to be today. So let's pray for the Spirit of God to teach us so that he can open our minds and our hearts um, in, 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 you know, in, in getting into the word of God that reveals to us what Christ has done and who Christ is so that we can worship him and serve him in spirit and in truth. Um, so reading from the Psalm, Psalm 51, 10 says, create in me a clean heart of God and renew a right spirit within me. Is this the prayer that you are praying? Is this the prayer that I'm praying? At the end of the day, really what matters is the heart. Uh, a clean heart is one where the word of God is hidden because when the word of God is hidden, then they will not sin against God. And um, from uh, yesterday, from the CFP quiz, our children hid the word of God. And congratulations to all those who participated from our church uh, and some one. Uh, to Hello, James, sir. to Jonathan, Shireen, Ethan, and Itai. Uh, if I missed anyone, I'm sorry, but we're all proud of you. And the more important thing is, Jesus is proud of you for having hidden his uh, 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 word in your heart. Um, a clean heart is where the word of God is hidden. So we won't sin and only Christ can create in us a clean heart. And without his steadfast spirit reigning in our hearts, all that comes out of us is actually the things that defile uh, evil thoughts and all. And so my prayer and my plea for myself and to you is that, Lord, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew your Holy Spirit within me. So, so with that said, um, you know, we've been studying the threefold chord in scripture, uh, the kingdom chord, the uh, covenant chord, and the salvation chord from the book of Genesis all the way to Revelation. And uh, as a quick recap, um, that which defies, which we cover, covered last week, God gives explicit instructions about the law of the bees to his people on what they can eat and what they cannot eat uh, from the land, from the water and from the air. Um, and then he, his people are not to even touch or carry or consume anything that is dead, have nothing to do with the things that are dead. For God is a God of the living, uh, as we see. God's people are not to defile themselves with what they eat, but instead must be distinct and holy. They should be clean just as God is holy. And it is not what we eat that defiles us. Instead, it is that which comes from our hearts, from within. While everything may be lawful or permissible, uh, but not everything may be profitable or edifying. And so there are protocols to follow as God has given this law to a redeemed people so that they can be distinct as part of their dietary habits from what we learned last week. And when one believes in Jesus Christ, their heart is actually washed. They get a heart wash by the blood of Jesus and are cleansed. And that's the most important part of that section itself that we studied last week. Uh, we've been going through the book of Leviticus. The first half of the book of the Leviticus is actually is as follows. One to seven talks about the holy protocols, the different types of uh, offerings, like the burnt offerings, the grain offering, the peace, the sin, and the trespass offering. And then from eight to 10, we actually learned about the holy priesthood as to the consecration of the Aaronic priesthood, the atonement offerings and the burnt offerings, then how God's glory appears as people offer unto them. And then the consequences of actually not keeping, being distinct and keeping the law of God, where it can be very dire and, 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 and in a, in a state of death uh, if you don't keep the law of God as, as we are called to be a holy priesthood. And 11 through 15, we've been studying, we just started that section last week with 11 being the dietary rules, 
uh, you know, what is clean and unclean and abomination to the law that you shall consume and what that means from the standpoint of what that which defiles. And then we'll be looking at 12 through 15 through the next couple of uh, weeks. And today I actually wanted to focus more on chapter 12, which is talking about the distinct rules or the, the rules that will make you distinct in terms of the circumcision that God talks about that should be done. And then also the purification of a woman after childbirth. So looking at Leviticus chapter 12, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 12. In the first very eight verses, talk about the law of childbearing, bearing in the issue of uh, blood and purification. In fact, it's only got eight verses in that whole chapter. So it's a pretty short chapter, but there is so much truth in it that we don't want to lose. And so I'll focus on the areas that we need to look at that actually are applicable and relevant to us in terms of how God wants us to be distinct. And so Leviticus chapter 2, sorry, 12, verse 1 to 5, it says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, if a woman has conceived seed and born a man child, a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days according to the days of the separation for her infirmity shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day, the flesh of a foreskin shall be circumcised. Uh, of the of his, sorry, of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And she shall then continue in the blood of a purifying three and thirty days, thirty-three days. She shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the day of a purifying be fulfilled. But if she bears a maid child or a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks as in her separation, and she shall continue in the blood of a purifying three score and six days, which is sixty-six days. So what if you look at this in terms of some of the stuff that we see over there, God is saying if a male child is born, she shall be unclean for seven days. If a female child is born, it shall be unclean for 14 days. And then a male child, she shall actually wait for 33 more days, which means 33 plus seven is 40 days of a time of purification that she would be in this in that state. And then in for a female child, it's going to be two weeks, which is 14 days, and then 60 to 66 other days, which would make it 80 days. So 40 days and 80 days is kind of given. And some people actually go so far as to saying, oh, God is kind of being sexist or being gendered, is making differences in terms of gender, uh, male and female and all that stuff. And I don't think that's really what God is actually trying to teach over here. We don't know explicitly as to why God says that, you know, it should be 40 days for a male child and six, 80 days for a female child, that she should be in that, in the blood of purification is what actually the scripture says, in the, you know, in terms of the blood of a purification purifying. And, and we don't know, the speculations from many commentators are, is it because that the God, God wanted the female child to have more time with the mother because the female child herself would be a mother to the nation of Israel or in the nation of Israel? We do not know it. The Bible does not explicitly give it and everything that was kind of written really is around conjecture about it. I don't have enough text from scripture to substantiate to say this, but what I want you to focus on and not forget as it goes over there, it's in sandwich actually between, you know, the male child and the female child where Leviticus chapter 12, verse 3, it actually commands circumcision. It's saying, and in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin for the male child shall be circumcised. Now, let me go back a few. We, we, we've been studying the covenant program. The circumcision is the sign of which covenant? We've studied the you know, Edenic covenant, the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, and now we are actually studying the Mosaic covenant. So circumcision is the sign of which covenant? Anyone? If you, if you look at Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, and Genesis chapter 17, it is the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Then what is circumcision doing in the Mosaic covenant? A truth that emerges from this is that it is so crucial that God does not change his covenant program. God's covenant program does not change. His covenant of love and grace does not change because God himself does not change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever within Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8. In fact, the Abrahamic covenant, which is a covenant of grace, where he says, I will bless you without conditions. Mosaic covenant, people would say, is actually a covenant of works. But in essence, if you look at it, it's still a covenant of grace, except that I will bless you with conditions. The blessing, because in the Abrahamic covenant, God says to, you know, in Genesis chapter 12, we see that in blessing, I will bless you. And in Genesis chapter 22, in blessing, I will bless you. Uh, and multiplying, I'll multiply you. And in, and in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, we read that Abraham said, you will be a blessing to all nations. 
And then here in the Mosaic covenant, God is saying the same, using the same sign as of that of the Abrahamic covenant, saying the male child shall be circumcised, meaning that the redeemed people will are to live redeemed lives so that they can be blessed in order for them to be a blessing to others. And through the people, through the children of Abraham, which is us who are brought into the children of us, being the children of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ, as we read in the epistles, we end up actually being, we, we end up being inheritance of that covenant of grace, and we're able to pass that on. So the circumcision is a very crucial aspect in terms of, and we'll, delve, we'll expand a little bit more on this in, in the subsequent sections here, uh, but it's a very crucial evidence, but I want you not to forget that, that the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant kind of juxtapose over here because of what God is saying or ordaining and commanding his people to be distinct as not the people of the land itself. And so it's important for us to recognize that. Then if we continue reading Genesis chapter, uh, sorry, Leviticus chapter 12, verses six and eight is what I'm going to read. And then I'll come back to verse seven. It says, and when the day of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of a first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priest. And if she be not able, reading verse 8, if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles or two doves and the one for the burnt offering and the other for the sin offering and the priest shall make atonement for her and she, she shall be clean. Now, it, this whole concept about, you know, in terms of uh, um, the, what is to be brought, he gives very explicit instructions and he also makes provisions for those who can't afford to bring something that was, or, or that was given for her purifying itself. And so it's interesting in this cleansing rich, in this cleansing offering that the mother is to bring to the, to the temple, God is making provision for all mothers to be able to actually make this offering and to be and to be cleansed. Now, this is not by having childbirth. This doesn't mean that she became unclean as she became a sinner. It's more we'll actually see about what that issue is, and it's the issue of blood that Christ that God will actually reveal to us that she is in that state of that could be you know that could be that could become infectious or so and don't come into any settings that is that is holy is what he's saying. It's kind of a preventive measure, not. Uh, one that is um, to, it's, it's more of the atonement, she shall make atonement for her is the covering so that she's protected and the rest of the community are also protected that in her in her state that she is for the days of purifying, you know, with the issue of blood is what the, the scripture will reveal to us very quickly. Uh, that so it's not that the mothers are sinful it's just that the mothers are protected in this context as well in terms of this offering that God is asking them to do now having said that this was in the mosaic covenant long time ago in the historical account itself today is there in the new testament an example of the circumcision and this cleansing offering or this purification offering anyone can think of any anybody who offered who, who went with circumcision and then uh, offered any mother that Mary, offered in the New Testament? Mary and Joseph offered them when Jesus was born. Yep, that's right. So if you read Luke chapter 2, verse 21 to 24, and when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising, circumcising of the oh, child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of, an angel, of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So Luke 12 actually gives the account of Jesus himself having been circumcised and then Mary offering this offering where it says, and when it's actually, and when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought to him to Jerusalem to present to the Lord. So they brought Jesus to Jerusalem to the presence of the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb you know, shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two, um, two young pigeons. Now, what are some observations from these, these things that we can glean from? There is, there is treasures that are true and relevant that I don't want you to miss. And I'm gonna expand on each of these words, but just you know, open it up and what are some of the observations that you see in this account of in the New Testament where the Mosaic covenant uh, in terms of being distinct from the from the law of the issue of blood and the law of the the purification uh, of the mother uh, is you know who's born a child comes uh, is is being fulfilled. Any thoughts? Thanks, Abby, for that. Okay, everybody's extremely bashful today, or 
not in a position to turn, open their microphones, but so let, let's go through each verse one at a time because there is so much truth that is relevant, okay? So let's read verse 21 from the book of Luke chapter two. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before, before he was conceived in the womb. Jesus, first observation, Jesus fulfills the law. Christ and his full family fulfilled all the law. They did not annul it. Certainly, Jesus did not violate any law, even though he was at times accused of breaking the laws when he was brought to trial. They tried to find their evidence against him. They didn't find any, so they brought false witnesses against him. Even those witnesses didn't agree with each other. And so there was nothing that could be brought against him in terms of him breaking any law. So number one, Jesus himself is one in his family, is one that actually fulfills the law. Next thing I want you to notice is that he is named after circumcision. To be named over there, it says, after circumcision of the child was accomplished on the eighth day, his name was called Jesus. So after circumcision is where his name is being made. So to be named as a child of God, we need to be circumcised first in our hearts. Romans chapter 2, verse uh, uh, 29, I'm reading from the ESV, is very clear where it says that the circumcision is a matter of the heart, but a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit. So the sword of the spirit, the word of God that actually circumcises the hearts of people is the one that is necessary because by preaching the word of God is the gospel preached and people are saved when their hearts are pricked and their hearts are cut as we see in Acts chapter 2 where their hearts were cut. The circumcision of the ma is a matter of the heart not just a matter of the flesh and it's not by the letter or not by just the law it is a it's by grace that we accept by through faith in Christ Jesus so his praise is not from man but from God so when we are saved we are saved so that we praise God who circumcises our hearts which is very relevant over here in the context of what is this heart that is being circumcised and the heart that is being circumcised is actually given in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, still within the context of the Pentateuch or the law of the books of Moses, within the Mosaic covenant itself. And it says, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy children to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that you may live. Without circumcision of the heart, everyone is dead. It is the pricking of the gospel that comes to circumcise our heart that will be given us a heart that will respond to love God with all of our heart, our entire essence, and all of our souls, our entire being, so that we may live. God wants us to live. And all of these offerings and all of these protection mechanisms, these things of being distinct that he gives unto us is so that we may not die, but that we may live. In fact, when we get to the Deuteronomy chapter 15, towards the end of this protocol period, the protocol section, where he gives about what it means to be a distinct people, a holy people of God, he will say that I've given all of this law so that you will not die in the tabernacle of my presence, that you may live. And the heart that God is wanting from each one of us is a heart that loves him with all of its being and with all of its essence with all thy heart with all thy soul so that we may live and god himself amazing the lord thy god father god thy god jesus christ is the one who circumcises our heart so it talks about circumcision of the heart and that's crucial then let's look at the next verse in Luke chapter 2, verse 22, and it says, And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him before the, the Lord. Now, whose purification is this actually? What are some of the observations from this verse? And whose purification is this actually being referenced? The day of? All right. Some of you help me out. Mary's, Mary's purification. Mary's purification. Huh. The Catholics, thank you, Raj. The, the Catholics call this day as the Candelmas day, right? But the truth over here is Mary herself needed purification. It debunks the theory of immaculate consumption. Immaculate consumption often is misunderstood in the context of thinking that it was the virgin birth of Christ. Iman, immaculate consumption by the, the Roman Catholic dogma is that Mary was born without original sin, mean to say that she was immaculate. And that is so contrary to the scriptures and we need to be aware of that. Mary was born naturally and they say, but she became impugned to the impact of sin, which 
defeats, which actually debunks and which, which, which actually contradicts the Romans chapter 3 verse 23 that all have sinned and, for the, and fallen short of the glory of God, including Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus, did not have immaculate conception. If, uh, in fact, the holy child of God who was conceived in her womb was who made her blessed. It was not that she was blessed and so she was given. She was highly favored because she found grace in the eyes of the Lord and grace is given to all sinners. It is the sick that need the physician, not the, the, the one who is uh, already healthy. So those who are sinners, so she herself was a sinner just like anyone else and she needed the purification and she, she comes in in terms of evidence over here, the greatest evidence that Mary was a sinner and needed salvation is not just because of Romans chapter 3 verse 23 which says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but it is from her very words where in Luke chapter 1 verse 41, Mary herself declares that she recognizes her savior and Mary said, it says, I'm reading from Luke chapter 1 verse 46 to 49 and it says, and Mary said, my soul that magnify the Lord and my spirits has, spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he has regarded the low estate of this handmaiden. And for behold, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. So her blessings came after her recognition of God, Jesus Christ, the child in her womb itself as her Savior. For he that is mighty has done this to me, these great things, and hallowed, holy, holy, holy is his name distinct is what God is wanting each one of us to be. So it's interesting that over here, we need to be aware of this, that from the very scripture, we understand that there is no one but God who is righteous. There is no one but God who is good, as we see from the very words of Jesus himself. And so now I want also want you to recognize one other thing. It was Mary's purification. Whose law was is this being referred to as? It's the law of? Moses. Thanks, James. It's the law of Moses. All right. So hold on to that thought for a few minutes and we'll get to meaning as to what this means in the context of the law of Moses. Now, the next verse, Luke chapter 2, verse 23 says, it's in parentheses there, it says, and it, as it is written, she came and offered him, presented him before the Lord, as it is written, the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy. Holy here again in the context where it's always used is about being sanctified or being distinct or being set apart. And if you read the verse, Luke chapter 2, verse 23, it says that every male that opens the womb, meaning to say that the womb is closed until the firstborn is born. And so every, every the firstborn is holy and set apart to the Lord. It means God wants the very first things of our lives, not the leftovers. How many times we give God only that which is left over? How many times, think of a time frame when you went back and you gave your first thing to God. You know, we talk about this in the context of dedication of the firstborn, but in all manners of life and all matters of life, God is not interested in, his left, in the leftovers. The whole world is his. He can take anything he wants. He wants us to voluntarily and volitionally give to him the very best, the very first. And that's why you see, and, is, and those are the offerings that are accepted, as was the offering of Abel, Abel himself. And so we, we, look, we look at it in the context of God wanting the very first things. Where in our study that we've done, studied so far, is the, have you seen the inscription, holiness to the Lord? The word phrase, holy to the Lord or holiness to the Lord. We've already studied this not too long ago. Anyone remember? When we studied about the priestly garments, and in Exodus chapter 28, verse 15, it says, and thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and grave upon it like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And that's the face plate that will go in front of the turban, in front of the turban of the high priest or, you know, or the mitre of the high priest, holiness to the Lord. As a kingdom of priests of God, there is the first thing in our minds, holiness to the Lord. Think about that. What are we looking at? What is our minds filled with? Are we being set apart, being distinct in terms of being holy to the Lord? An important question for each one of us to ask, including myself, and to respond back in sincerity and truth and say, if Lord, there is anything unholy in me, create in me a clean heart and a steadfast right spirit, a renewed Holy Spirit in me that I may actually be holy to the Lord. So last verse of that pericope is Luke chapter 20, from Luke chapter 2, 21 to 24. Verse 24, it says, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Any observations from this verse? 
It shows that they couldn't afford a sheep. Absolutely. Jesus' family was not wealthy because re re remember Leviticus chapter 12, verse 8. And if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, the one for the burnt offering and the other for the sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her and she shall be clean. Mary offers a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, not a single male lamb without blemish, as was given in terms of the first. If it, that cannot be afforded. Now, an interesting thought is that that came as I was studying this part of the scripture is that the Passover lamb of the world was already being presented before the Lord. So technically she had brought the lamb, but that is mere conjecture for any diligent student of the word of God to kind of recognize. Don't quote me on that because that's not scripturally substantiated, but she it does show that she was, Mary was in a position that she could not afford and she had to come and bring, you know, the, the offering as was commanded in the law of Moses. And it's interesting over here where what we read earlier and what James said was the law of Moses, here it says, and to offer a sacrifice according to the law of the Lord. Okay, we'll come to that in a second. But before I get to that, I want to talk about wealth. Is there anything wrong with wealth? No. No, okay, thanks Shireen. What is the root of all evil? Is money the root of all evil? Not as long as you let it like control you. Okay, very good. We'll get to that. Money. So, as, as long as you don't let it control you, we'll talk about that beautiful point. If you put it, if you put it over God, or you make it an idol, then I think that's when it becomes. Wrong. Okay, nice. So this, if you make it over God, if it takes the place of God, and it becomes an idol in our lives, so don't idolize wealth. So, is money the root of all evil? No, the love of money is. So, one Timothy six ten is very clear where it says the root of all evil is not money itself, but the love of money. So it talks about in the context of, but they that which will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in the destruction and perdition or in sinfulness. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some covet after. They have erred from faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Ex beautiful words. And how the scripture is so coherent and cohesive that it's unbelievable in terms of how God teaches us that they have pierced themselves. That reminds me of the parable of the sower. In Mark chapter 4, the first of the parables where we read, where parables reveal to us the secrets of the kingdom of God, with Mark chapter 4, verse 11, which it says, and Jesus actually says in the parable of the sower, if you do not understand this parable, you will not understand any of my other parables. In Mark chapter 4, verse 13. But in Mark chapter 4, verse 4 to 30, you know, 11 onwards, when he's talking about the parable of the, the, the sower and the seed, on Mark chapter 4, verse 19, he talks actually of the seed that falls on thorny grounds that chokes the word of God, that pierces the word of God from, from being fulfilled. And so in, in Mark chapter 4, verse 19, we read, and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of the other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. And so we can't produce the fruit of the spirit when these things actually pierce us. So what are the three things that pierce us? I want you to remember, and since we have kids over here also, I want you to remember the three W's. We always, whenever you type some URL into our web websites to go to a website we type www so remember three w's that we need to be on watch for always and the cares of the world that he's talking about these thorns that can prick us is first word w is worries of the world so don't worry what you will eat or you will drink for the you know god knows even before we can ask or think he knows to fulfill our desires so worry that applies to all adults as well because we worry a lot we worry about all the things and we plan for it nothing wrong with that but it's important for us to be able to present our request by prayer and thanksgiving before god so first w is worry the second is wealth the deceitfulness of wealth and so it's important because wealth will just fly away if it's got by uh, dishonest gains and and it's very clear in the book of proverbs we read that and the third w is the want so what the world's worries the worries of the world the wealth and its deceit and then the wants or the lusts of the flesh that actually choke the word of god and makes us be unfruitful having said that reuben kind of talked about you know as long as we don't let it control us or possess us wealth possessions should not be possessing wealth there's nothing wrong in possessing wealth but don't let that wealth possess you. In fact, they've been through the Abraham and uh, Abraham and others, God blessed them so richly so that they could be a blessing. So if God has given you much, give much more. If God has given you little, give much more. It's the same process, same thing. That's what we read in the, the parable of the poor widow in Mark chapter 12, verse 41 to 44, where she came and gave two small copper coins. 
and she had given all is what Jesus said because she had given out of her poverty and Jesus commended her and said that she had given much more than all of the large deposits that were made by the rich people in that world who gave out of richness. So it's important for us to recognize that in terms of the wealth itself, that it's not it's the pursuit of happiness is the Lord of the wealth, not the wealth itself. And God will give. In fact, that's why in Proverbs chapter 30, it's very clear and, the, and, and Agur is making this request and Agur is saying, you know, I'm praying for two things that I will not lie and keep liars from me, meaning let the lips of mine not actually say that I profess God and lie in my heart or keep my dishonor God in my hearts with the lifestyle that I live. And then he says, and keep liars from me is don't put me in the presence of the iniquity or the people that can give me badly counsel that don't live, that live a duplicitous lifestyle as well. And then he says something which is very interesting in Proverbs chapter 30, verse seven to nine, it says, don't give me too much that I will deny you by thinking I can be independent of, apart from God. And don't give me too little that I can, I will actually have to go steal, not don't give, neither give me riches nor poverty, just give me enough, give us this day our daily bread. Important thing for us to recognize as kingdom people in the kingdom of God, that we don't aspire to be the, the millionaires in this world that everything will rot and, and go away, but to be able to store up treasures in heaven. So and it's important for us to keep that in mind. And, and, and Jesus' family, him, it's, family was not wealthy, but they kept the law and Jesus gave his all himself without ever owning a home he didn't have a home nor did he even even have a coin because he had to ask the disciples to go and fish out for a coin to give to god what is god and to give the tax to caesar the imperial tax to caesar that that which was caesar he didn't have anything but he gave everything so are you in pursuit of the riches of this world or storing treasures in heaven? And that is something that we need to take away in terms of this distinctness that God wants us as he's teaching us. The other thing I wanted us to recognize is that the law of Moses that was referenced earlier, as James said it, was identified, is now actually being referred to as the law of the Lord. Notice the law of Moses is referred to as the law of the Lord, which gives us even more reason that the law of the Old Testament is still applicable just as much as it's today as it is in the in the past. I think Brother Charles had sent me some articles and, and, and he, had, he had raised in the previous study that people are doing away with the Old Testament and all these Levitical stuff and all that, even mainstream evangelicals. And that's a dangerous place to be because if the foundations are cracked, then the superstructure of faith, of a life of faith, can not actually be, be built on top of it. So, you know, the sacrifices were offered in, as a token of purification. And so I'll get to the next part of it where we talked about what is this that she was being having to be purified of. And the purification, Leviticus chapter 12, verse 7, the verse that we had not read earlier, which we had skipped for now, is that it says, who shall offer it before the Lord and make an atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that has borne a male or a female. So it's the law of purification, which is actually a blood issue is what it is. It's an issue of the blood. It's a blood issue. And the mother had to make a sacrifice as an atonement, not because she had given birth, but because of the issue of blood. And the burnt and the sin offerings, the blood is shed to purify the issue of blood, is what we read from this. Now, in the New Testament, is there a reference to the issue of blood? Where do we see that? It's in the Gospel of Mark, and Mark chapter 5, if you look at 25 to 34, it says, and a certain woman who had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many phys many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better, but rather grew better. She went and saw all the doctors that she could find and get many physicians. She spent everything that she had, but instead of her situation getting better, she actually got worse. When she heard of Jesus, she came in press behind and touched his garment. So she comes, she doesn't even come and face Jesus. She from the, from the back, she kind of comes and tries to steal this miracle. And so she comes behind and touches this. For what did she say? She said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. So hold on to the word whole. We'll get to that in a second. And straight away, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power or virtue had gone out from him, turned us about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said, thou seest the multitude thronging thee and sayest thou who touched me? It's amazing what Jesus in the crowd identifies and singles out a person. That's what he does today. You may be in the church, you may be in your homes, you may be in your uh, workplaces. Amongst the crowd, Jesus is looking for one who's reaching out and touching him. And he identifies and he questions and asks, 
who is it that touched me? And he looked about to see her. His gaze is not on the crowd, it is on the one. He, the good shepherd leaves the 99 to go after the one in order to find the one that is lost. And when he finds the one who is lost, takes and puts, it, puts the sheep on, the, on, the, on, on his shoulders and rejoices. Amazing picture of Christ looking out for each one of us and seeking to see us. And then the woman, you know, fearing and trembling, she knew that the master, the Lord had known all that had happened, knowing what was done in her. Salvation had been worked in her. She had been saved and delivered of this plague, came and fell down. She came and worshiped, fell down before him and told him all the truth about what her situation was before and after the touch of Christ. She reached out to touch Christ, but it was in fact Jesus who had touched her and healed her completely. And he said unto her, daughter, remember Jesus over there is a man. He refers to her as a daughter, now taking the, the, the position of a father. Today is Father's Day. The everlasting father is his name. And he addresses his children and he says, daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Amazing picture here of the issue of blood that is being addressed and a cleansing that takes place and a purification that takes place. What I don't want you to forget is that the words, when you read, look at word, chapter, verses 28 and 34, it talks about the word being used as whole, that you are made whole. And the word actually in its root means sozo, which means to be saved or delivered. In the context over here and the context of purification and cleansing, the purification means to be made whole. And it's not the blood of lambs and birds, but of Christ Jesus alone, because it is not the blood of the offerings of the lambs and bread that can purify us, but it is the blood of Jesus Christ, because other than the blood of Jesus Christ, there can be no purification made or no one can be made whole. It is by the power of Christ that comes in us that actually can purify and make us whole, can cleanse us. And notice also where he says, daughter, thy faith has made thee whole, go in peace. Peace comes after the purification of God. The question I have for you and me today is, do we have the peace of God? Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and he can give you the peace, not as the world can give, but as the one that passeth all understanding. He's the only one who has the power to purify and to make us whole or to deliver us from the plague of sin, to deliver us from the issue of blood guilt that we all are, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so with that said, I'm going to go into time of summary, and then we'll have, open it up for some time of questions. In the, in the law of the woman who has given birth to a male or a female, God commands circumcision for the male child. The mother is to give offerings for cleansing of the issue of blood. Circumcision, which is a sign of the Abrahamic covenant, is a requirement of the Mosaic covenant that signifies that setting apart of the Israelite male child, that signifies the setting apart of the Israelite male child under God, the first things of life. Circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, by the sword of the spirit, and it is the Lord thy God who will circumcise thy heart to love God and to love thy neighbors, the greatest of all commandments. Only Jesus has the power to purify and make one whole to save mankind, all of mankind, because he shed his blood for us and he became the perfect offering, the cleansing offering for us to make us distinct. So the time to reflect is, have you been made whole? Have you called and believed in Jesus Christ the Lord? That's what it means. Have you been made whole? Are you still in a state of needing purification and being cleansed and you know, still in a state of sin? If you have been made whole, is your heart circumcised by the spirit? That is, it, that is, is it one that loves God with all thy heart and all thy soul? So I'll open it up for a time of uh, you know, discussion, questions, observations, comments, and uh, we'll take it from there. So from today's study, What is circumcision? What is circumcision? Um, it's in the context of the Old Testament law. It was a thing that they did to male children eight uh, uh, days old. And I'll let your dad and mom kind of talk to you about it. But it is where they cut a part of the skin of the body uh, to, you know, to be, to be distinct. That these are the, all the all the Jews were circumcised uh, to set them apart from those who were non-Jews.
Okay, but more, more, okay. more, more important thing, Shireen, as God is saying, is your heart cut because we have a heart of stone that in natural propensity is being driven away from God, drives us away from God. For there is Romans, Paul writes, there is nothing good in me. And so praise be to God, Jesus Christ, who's, who can take this body of death and make it. And so circumcision of the heart is what Jesus is saying in terms of cutting your heart, meaning to say, when you hear the word of God and you put the word of God in your heart, let the spirit of God, with the word of God, with the sword of the spirit, actually cut our heart so that it will be one that will love God and love others because they are the greatest of the commandments. So love God and love man, which makes the sign of the cross. Loving God up and loving others, you know, making the sign of the cross. There's also a reference to uh, the, the covenant, uh, the Abrahamic covenant, when uh, God passed through those cut pieces of uh, animals. Yeah. Uh, saying, you know, that's the covenant uh, he's going to cut. And it, it seems to be some correlation with what you're saying with that as well. Man. Right. I, I think the, the, the word for the covenant itself means um, um, is mean cut or to cut a contract. And so cutting, that's actually a beautiful point in terms of the covenant it was made by cutting and the shedding of blood. Cutting in the Abrahamic covenant was cutting of the person or the flesh in order to be set apart that they were part of a covenanted people. Um, it was not circumcision that saved them. They were saved to be circumcised and then as a redeemed people. And then, um, you know, in, 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 the, in, the, in the New Testament, it is the circumcision of the heart or the cutting. So um, the, the, the Hebrew word for covenant actually means to cut, to cut a contract. Very good thoughts, Charles. Hey, Mano. Um... Yeah. What does the love of money look like in a practical sense? Because, I mean, all of us, <clears throat> if I ask the question, we'll say, oh, yeah, I don't love money. I love God more. And yet, when it comes to our tithes and our financial stewardship, um, we fall way behind. Right. And we don't want anyone to touch us in that area because we guard that with a passion when it comes to money. And yet we claim, oh, I love God. Great, great question. I will. There are there are two there are two ways I look at it. Um, and the others, if you have thoughts to add, please do. And Brother Trini, if you have thoughts as well, please please share. I know you asked the question, and sometimes you ask the question knowing the answer. Um, <laughs> so so um, that's how much I know you, Brother Trini. <laughs> so so in terms of the love of money, one is the pursuit of money what you have what you do not have or for that matter wealth that you do not have that is so driven that there is nothing else but the love of god takes second place so whether it is in terms of materialistic things or it could be in some instances even in the context of in the, in the context of money it's usually materialistic things uh, wealth and popularity knowing being known around uh, for your wealth and so on and so forth I think that there's also another aspect to it, which is the second side of it is what you have not willing to give. So there is one which is wanting to get in terms of the love of money. The other is not willing to give what you already have. And I think the, the parable of the poor widow or in the instances where God teaches us about giving, God loves a cheerful giver, is, is to say that let your heart be still of cheer when it is hard to give you still give, whether it's in the context of tithes and offerings. Malachi is very clear where he says, you are robbing me of the tithes and offerings. Why don't you even test me and come? So robbing God is a love of money. And then trying to gain riches of the world is another aspect in terms of you know, storing up treasures here on earth as opposed to storing up treasures in heaven. And, and, and Paul kind of alludes to this where he says, I have learned to be content in when, I was, when, I, when I had everything and I've learned to be content when I have nothing. And, you know, in my weaknesses is God's strength perfected. So the love of money, I think, is also in, the, in that context, a distrust of God, the giver of all good things, that we rely, we, we're trying to assume and it, it kind of in the, in the Exodus account, they went and gathered manna, but God says on the seventh day, you shall not. On the sixth day, you gathered enough for the seventh day, you shall not. But still it says that there are some who went to gather more for themselves. So it's a gathering of what we think we need to sustain life instead of trusting God is kind of that love. And then the other is what we have been given, holding back and not giving to God so that his, you know, what that blessing can go on to be a blessing to others. Well, Shini, did that 
help yeah yeah it was it was more of a personal reflection application question okay <laughs> sorry <laughs> but, but thanks that's for a very that good yeah. question i think each one of us have to go back and see what are the things we're trying to gather and what are the things we're holding back and not giving giving to god that god wants us to hey mano on that uh, just keying off of what trini brought up um we see that if there is one person it is mary who who just bore the son of god and there are two things that are striking in what she does especially in the in the luke in dr luke's account right mm -hmm. one is about obedience in ensuring that each of the levitical law to the dot is done that she obeys regardless of what the angel said uh, she could have said i'm the mother of god and she probably you know is the last person to need to actually want to give money because she has just you know the the the, the holiness and full form of a human and god in in her own house but we also see in terms of the giving it's not that there was excess clearly as you pointed out earlier she couldn't afford more than the two turtle doves right that and the pigeons that's that's clearly a reflection in terms of our economic status during the time yeah. so in spite of her circumstance what she points out it really jumps out to me from the scriptures here is how obedient am i mm -hmm. in yes i have accepted jesus but how obedient am i in all circumstances and how giving am i especially in the circumstance where it is the purse strings are tightened up but yet you set aside other things because for her i'm sure with the newborn and uh, with with her social status it it must have been something still the, the cost of that must have been something but yet she chose to sacrifice that to ensure that the law is kept so that is another portion in terms of how you give is also a heart attitude it's a heart condition that goes back to so those are two things that i really found it to be personally applicable and very useful thank thank you josh uh, good reflection for each one of us to recognize how do we react when circumstances are not too good uh, and how do we react when it's easy to give when you have plenty but when you don't is you know and then the most important thing here at the end of the day is giving of our lives to jesus christ if we have not ever given our lives to him right giving our all the women the poor widow gave everything um god, god is interested in our lives he seeks to see us so that his power can be manifested in us and through us then by our our salvation others will come to know christ as well and so uh, how are we doing in that area how, how personally i struggle in that context when i have to I, you know it's easy to teach but when you have to put it into practice and you have to say god give me that strength i need to be able to rely on you and trust you completely right that you know what is best for me it's a hard place to be in and uh, and we've got to be true with god and come to him with offering our all um you know despite our richness or in spite of our richness or our poverty you know let me not ever deny god by being too rich let me not dishonor god by being too there's a lord, lord give me just enough and give me your grace and jesus you know my grace is sufficient for you is what he tells us is more than sufficient for us any other thoughts see something on the chat uh, let me look at that while i'm looking at the chat if anyone has any questions thoughts comments so mano one one other thing um uh, with regards to whether brother josh was saying also is <clears throat> you know we have to be careful how we treat our fellow brothers and sisters not to measure by the giving amount and stuff because i i know in the churches i've been at before right the pastors are very careful to bring correction say from a high to a high tithing member or something because there is this financial obligation for the local body and things like that so 
I mean that that also tends to be a love of money more than God, especially from a leadership standpoint. Right. Right. Actually, that's a yeah. that's a very good point. It's a church issue, and especially for those who are in administration and financial management. Um, see, God is not a God who plays favorites. Um, he really doesn't care how rich you are, how poor you are, and what you give. He cares how you give in terms of the matter, the manner of the heart by which you give. God loves a cheerful giver, and 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 so you're right. Men look at bank balances and books and what has been given, and sometimes and most times and always mistakenly attribute that giving of a person who has given a larger amount to the church as being holiness. But holiness doesn't come by giving. Because we are made holy, we give. Because we are made blessed and saved is why we give and why we should give. Um, it's, it's a very, very, it's a beautiful, you brought that up because it's a problem in the churches, in the church of God. And the devil knows that if he starts to shake the, you know, the core in the, in the aspects of the, of the church, then it, it, the, even within the, the company of Christ, people who were gathered around him were worried about the expensive jar of perfume of pure nard that was broken. And they said, what a waste of this, this perfume, because this lady could have actually broken the jar sold all that for more than a year's wages. That's a lot of amount in that time. If you were to take even today your own personal wages and then given it to the poor, they thought that serving the poor by the giving of that money was what would be ascribing to them this, this aspect of being close to Christ. And Jesus actually rebukes them. He says, she's done a beautiful thing. She's given everything she had to come and anoint me. And, and, and that's what, are we anointing Christ by what we have. And it's not by the expensiveness of what we give. Jesus doesn't give any concern to the rich people over there in, the, in that place that were questioning her or him or who were rebuking her. And so it's important for us to practice that within our church as well. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Well, Shreem. Living with wartime simplicity is what Christians are called for. We live like we are in a war, conserve our resources and help everyone around the world. John Piper. Nice. Thanks, Charles, for sharing that in the chat. So, yeah, how matters as well. Are we doing giving joyfully or cheerfully? So, uh, I, 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 I've got a minute. I can tell you a kind of quick, uh, it's actually a joke. Um, um, and it's not from the scripture, but it's a joke. But father gives, uh, you know, being Father's Day, father gives, uh, a, a dollar to a, a, a son and gives uh, 25 cents uh, and a dollar to, to the son and says, I want you to remember this. God loves a cheerful giver. So when the offertory time comes, you decide what you want to give. Uh, and the little boy, um, you know, when the offertory plate came, he, he put his hand in and gave, gave what he wanted to give. And then when the, the father, after the service was over, went to the boy and said, uh, hey, son, um, um, what choice did you make? Uh, did you give a dollar or did you give the 25 cents? And the son said, right uh, as I was going to give the dollar, the pastor said, um, God loves a cheerful giver. And I was more cheerful in giving the 25 cents and not the dollar. So I gave the 25 cents. And that's not what it means. But, you know, it does matter in terms of giving out of our cheerfully despite our circumstances. So if one of you could pray, if there's no other questions, if one of you could kindly pray, um, um, you know, and we can close this uh, session. Thank you for all your interactions, all the questions, the comments, for all those who participated, James, Abby, Ruben, Srini, Josh, everybody, Josh Charles and all, all who participated and for the chat and things, you know, it's always encouraging to have this interaction, to learn from the word of God, because we learn from one master and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. If one of you could kindly pray, we can close. Josh. Father, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time. We praise you and we thank you and we acknowledge your presence here this morning. Lord, as we heard uh, that you are our King of Kings and Master, we just saw the beautiful account in the book of Luke as to giving and how sacrificially uh, Mary and, and, and the family just uh, uh, adhere to the law in spite of the circumstances of oh, master lord we pray oh father we ask this morning as, as it is being father's day we pray for all the fathers of oh, master you are our eternal and our everlasting father we thank you for adopting us as your sons and daughters oh master we acknowledge your presence here and we also pray for the balance of this morning for the service 
as pastor and uh, the team brings forth a special service this morning lord we pray that you would bless all the fathers especially and we pray that a special prayer of blessing upon their households of master we thank you and we praise you father we also pray a special prayer of thanks for mano sangeeta pastor and uh, the family who has been spending time so much investing the time and talents in bringing your word so powerfully that you have been revealing to them every week after week we thank you lord we pray that you will anoint them in a special prayer of blessing upon the family lord we love you we give you glory and honor in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you all god bless you brothers and sisters see you in church where we'll get to hear more about the word of god so god bless you all thank you mano thank you mano thank you brother mano bye bye thank you